You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 134. On today's show, I chat with insurance broker Bruce Comero about life insurance. We discuss term, whole, universal, and blending, health screenings, how insurance is regulated, how much coverage to get, where and how to purchase, converting term to whole up until age 65, and options for those trying to get a higher return on the market. Before we get started, I want to remind you about our book club meeting this Sunday. We're joined by theater designer Carl Faber, who will give us his thoughts on You Are a Badass at Making Money by Jen Sincero. I will admit I'm only in chapter one, but I'm listening to the audiobook at 2x speed, and I'm going to get there. Even if you don't read the book, you can still attend and listen. This week, our prizes are hats from LDG, the Lighting Design Group. Find photos of those hats and all the details about the meeting at artisticfinance.com slash book club. And one more reminder before we start, and that is to make sure that you're contributing to your Roth IRA. Any retirement account will do, but Roth IRAs are super easy to set up and they're super beneficial if you're just getting started. If you don't have one yet, create the account now. Yes, if you're able to, pause this episode and go do it. And remember to set up automatic payments into it to make sure that you're setting aside money for retirement, whether you remember to or not. Without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. Welcome, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Ethan Steimel, and today I welcome insurance expert, Bruce Allen Camaro. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you for having me. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, We're recording this on February 7th, 2023, and just off the bat, I want to get a, give a disclaimer that people shouldn't take action on what we're saying, maybe. No, they, they need to uh, engage an agent or broker, and they need to uh, sit down with that person and, and uh, develop a plan. Don't go out and just buy insurance. You should consult an expert. So I'm going to do that today with you. <laughs> um, and also one more thing I wanted to say that you and I were introduced through Matt Queller, who is our financial advisor, and also you're related to him in I am some related way. to him. I am uh, uh, his mother and my uh, wife are first cousins, so I believe that makes me a first cousin once removed by marriage. So, uh, and, and Matt is also uh, a client of mine. Uh, full dis- full disclosure. All right. So first things, just some icebreaker questions here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? My ro- my route uh, and arrival to the insurance business was uh, somewhat unusual. So uh, I was trained. Uh, I went to Washington University in St. Louis. I was trained as a sinologist, which is a China expert and a uh, and a Russian expert. I went with my father, who was in the who had a diamond business, to China in the early '80s to try to open up diamond cutting factories. That was ultimately not successful. I was then trained as a diamond cutter, went into his business, and then after he suddenly passed away and the economics of diamonds were not uh, was not good, I started to look for another career. And uh, my mother suggested I go into the diamond business. And I, th- uh, sorry, not the diamond business, the, uh, the insurance business. It was not easy, but it was, it was very interesting. And I was told to develop a niche or, a, you know, product or, or a client niche. Uh, so I did both. So I started selling because my wife uh, was uh, doing a lot of food journalism at the time. Uh, I started selling disability uh, to chefs and restaurants. From there, it just broadened out, and I have a lot of uh, client bases in restaurants, chefs, uh, optometrists, small, closely held businesses, uh, and also now nonprofits. That's a little bit about how I, I got in there. I've been in the business for uh, 20 some odd years now. Amazing. Di- from diamonds to life insurance. And, and uh, international affairs. So you go from one thing to another. Th- so it's, 
it's unusual. I think you'll find that a lot of, that there's a lot of agents or brokers out there that might have this as a second career. So I could see myself as a life insurance agent or broker soon enough. <laughs> you might. <laughs> Amazing. So now, what is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? That's interesting. Blue Man Group. Oh, all right. I found it to be uh, quite uh, quite funny, and uh, it was a very interesting show. All right. Yeah, it's it's been running for, well, I don't know, 30 years or so, but I've never seen it. And Stomp just closed, because Blue Man Group and Stomp are both sort of downtown theater running off, off, off Broadway for, you know, 30 years, and Stomp just closed. But Blue Man Group was bought by Cirque du Soleil, so I think it's going to stick around. Now, your financial personality, are you good or bad with money? Uh, I would say that I'm, I'm good with money. I, I have been trained in the investment field, as well as insurance, to sell various uh, sort of uh, hybrid insurance, pro- variable insurance products was considered a security. I do have an investment background, even though I do not professionally advise as uh, an investment advisor, mm-hmm. like what Matt does. My expertise lies in the, the area of structuring uh, and analyzing insurance for, for clients. Some insurance agent brokers actually do investments, but uh, I do not. I had a Series 6 license, which is a mutual fund license. Uh, so the, I guess the answer would be yes. All right. So now what we're going to talk about today, which is life insurance. And the reason we're talking about it is because Nicole and I are expecting a baby in April. I just merely mentioned it to Matt. And within 30 seconds, the phone was ringing. And he said, OK, well, you should start applying for life insurance now because uh, it takes a little bit of time. And that would be a good step. And then he said a couple other things. So that just made me think that Nicole and I know nothing about life insurance. And so I just want to know all about it. So, of course, I go to Google, of course. (laughs) But I thought, you know what? I should get an expert in here and and pick their brain. That's why you're here. And so I guess my first question is, who should have it and why is it important? All very good questions, and and there is no right answer for any of them, uh, or single answer. So who should have insurance? Okay. A traditional situation is you and your wife. You may both work, so back many years, you know, back in the, uh, how should we say, the middle of the 20th century? In the, the old days. The old days, when the male usually worked and the wife was at home, usually they would simply say, get the, the husband or the working spouse should get insurance. That, of course, did not focus on the value that people who stay at home uh, bring to uh, to a marriage. So now, fast forward, we're now in the 21st century. It really depends on what your financial obligations are. Both partners could work. One could work, one could not work. In general, it's someone who has a financial obligation. You each have a financial obligation to to each other, so I would say, you know, usually both spouses should get it, even if you're not married, even if uh, you don't have kids. It's an important thing to have because if something were to happen to either one of you, you don't necessarily realize what the financial impact would be on that person. They're dealing with grieving. They're dealing with a lot of things. They may not be able to work for quite for quite some time. So. If you look at a traditional uh, couple, you're married, you, ha- you have financial obligations when you have children, then the obligations become even greater. Anybody could have it if they wanted to, for example, leave a, uh, a legacy to a charity or a legacy to someone who's close to them but is not necessarily a blood relative or someone who depends on them for f- financial support. The fact that I got to age 34 without having it, I probably should have had it at this point. (laughs) And and also, I'll I'll say that, so I've freelanced, so I don't have any specific employer that I'm working for. Now, Nicole has worked, and she has like a tiny little policy that sort of comes, it's part of her benefits. That would be a group policy, which is different than an individual policy. So many employers will have a, a program where they put in place where they provide a certain amount of coverage. It usually could be one or two times their base salary. There really is no underwriting because 
there's a lot of people who just are put on a plan like that. So there's there's no individual underwriting. You go in, sign the application, and it can be deducted from from salary. Now they're very difficult. They're convertible by law, meaning that you could take it with you, but because the insurance company hasn't had a lot of your personal information or hasn't under, underwritten you personally, uh, when you convert it, it becomes uh, very expensive. So usually it's not taken when people leave the uh, employee of that of that company. Got it. So it's only covered while you're working there. So we were thinking, okay, now we're going to have a baby. So now we get life insurance. But backtracking, we probably should have done it once we got married. Uh, actually, when I was in college, uh, I was approached by someone to to buy insurance, and I didn't do it myself because I didn't understand insurance, and I really didn't think that uh, I could afford it. People should buy insurance as young as possible because demographics is 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 destiny when it comes to when it comes to insurance. You know, parents can buy insurance on on their kids, and uh, it becomes a great asset and they're paying very little you would obviously uh, I could get into the types of insurance but you would probably buy a whole life policy on a on a young child premiums are very low and as they grow into adults they have a very inexpensive asset that continues to accumulate a cash value and it has a death benefit as well so that's one way to to deal with that question that you have where you say, well, I should have gotten it when I was younger. Well, your parents can... My parents should have gotten it. Your parents should have gotten it for you. (laughs) But a lot of people when they're younger don't really understand the value of it. They may not be able to afford it. In my case, you know, I I wish now I probably should have bought, you know, I should have bought that that insurance back then. Talking with Matt, we was like, okay, we need a 529 plan, sort of stuff like that. But now I'm now I'm hearing... Do I need to buy this for my child too? It's not a bad idea, and it and it really is inexpensive. It's, it's very inexpensive. In order to do that, in uh, I mean, we're here in the state of New York. In the state of New York, uh, you need to have four times the amount of insurance that you buy on, on a child. Uh, so you have to have the insurance yourself, and right. it's got to be four times greater than what you're purchasing on your on your child. Got it. So if I have a policy that will pay out $100,000, I can only get them $25,000. That's correct. That's Interesting. Long. To keep me from murdering them? Is that why? <laughs> I hate to say I it. I don't know how else to say that. No, it, 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 is, uh, it is done so that there is no economic incentive to, to, <laughs> to do something. Uh, to, to shake the baby. To, okay. to do something, uh, how should we say, uh, Wrong. <laughs> yes, inappropriate or, or w- with the child. It, it's, okay. it's due to, to reduce the economic exploitation of it. But yeah, okay. that's, right. that's why it's done. Okay. All right. And then the other thing you said, which is even if you're single, you could still do it because the payout could go to a charity. There's a number of issues. One, you might get married. So if you buy it when you're younger, uh, you're, you're, saving, you're saving a good deal of money for when you might be able to get it. Because it'll be more expensive for me now that I'm married or that I'm 34? Not that you're married, but that you're, let's say, 10 years older than when you were, when you could have, well, let's say you bought it. So I could have been paying $10 a month and instead now I'm going to be paying $50 a month? Yeah, you're going to be paying more. That's just how it works. I mean, you can look at it on a timeline. The, The older you get, the greater your chances are of passing away uh, and, and therefore it increases. What, what also increases the, uh, the premium is your health when you apply. And as you get older, obviously, your health can, can be affected. That's another aspect that makes it more expensive. So if our, if our insurance, future insurance agent is listening, Nicole and I are in very good health. We have never had any problems whatsoever. We, we go to the doctor just to check in every year, but uh, they say we're, they've never seen anybody so healthy as us. <laughs> well, then, then you're good. You're looking at, you're looking at the, highest, the, the highest rating you can get, ultra preferred, as they say. That's what we're going for, ultra preferred. When you're young, if you buy a policy that has cash value, like whole life, that will accumulate, and it does accumulate on a tax-deferred, tax-advantage basis. So... Uh, you could use that asset at some point. It can be very useful. So 
Back when I got started, I sold a policy to my best friend. He was paying about $1,200, $1,500 a year. You know, he kept paying that into, into the policy. Last year, he said, you know, I'm in between jobs. I've got the situation. I need some money. I said, let me, let me look up on the, on the policy. He had put in money into this policy for about 20 some odd years. And he put in about $25,000. So his cash value at that time was $75,000. He borrowed against it and is, in, in essence, uh, borrowing from himself. He used that asset to, you know, to help him, and he can pay it back over time, or when he passes away, the amount of the loan will be deducted from the death benefit. So... A whole life policy could be a, an alternate asset that can be very useful. You know, he didn't really realize it. And I kind of was kind of shocked when I looked at it because I hadn't looked at it in a while. And he said, I said, you know what? You got $75,000 of cold hard cash in that policy. And that's yours. You know, he could have taken it and surrendered the policy, which means you give it back to the insurance company. And they are no longer on the hook for the death benefit. And you get a check. And anything over, uh, over the money that you put in, because that's considered return of premium, is taxable as income. However, if you borrow against it, it's a loan. So it's, it's, not, it's not taxable, as long as the policy stays in force. So that's just an example of an, I mean, he's now divorced, he has kids, but here's an, that, that could be an example that a, where a single individual might get whole life insurance, especially when they're younger and it's not that expensive. And then they have this asset that's there that they can use in a number of ways. You said he put $25,000 in, but then his value was $75,000? That's from dividend interest. So the way a whole, pol- a whole life policy works is that you're guaranteed a certain dividend interest rate, and then you get a current dividend interest rate which is usually higher, but the current changes each year. Could be the same, could be lower, uh, could be higher. But you always get a guaranteed uh, dividend interest in a whole life policy. This is where an expert would come in to look at what policy would be best for you. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, endorse any particular policy uh, right now, but you look at you know, they'd look at what your health is, what your age is, look at what the uh, rates are. And then they would look at also how the dividend interests are paid, the rate that they are paid, uh, which is something you look at in a cash value with a whole life policy. So those are the factors that you would look at. But again, the, the, the issue is, well, why would I buy insurance if I'm single? It's, that's one reason, because it, it is... It is uh, uh, it's like forced savings. That is a term that's used, the forced savings account. When you deal with really high-rated companies that are AAA rated, uh, I mean, I wouldn't sell a policy that isn't from an A-rated company, but the, you can go up to AAA rating. So there are a number of companies that are AAA rated, very well managed. Some of the best ones are mutual companies, which means that when you buy a policy, you become a part owner in that in that company. Uh, it's not a stock company, but they're very well run. So. The guarantees in that policy are significant, and a lot of people in economic, uh, where there's economic volatility and uncertainty, a lot of people do put money in whole life policies. All right, so I, I feel like we answered why is it important and who should get it, which is sort of like everybody if you can. What is life insurance? I mean, I think I know the idea, and then what types are there? Life insurance is, is, is the ability to leverage a, a very small amount of money for a large amount of money that is paid out when you die, whether it's uh, early in your life or late in your life. You're usually paying pennies on the dollar, in essence. You know, if you're young enough, you're looking at term insurance, and I'll explain that in a second. You can be spending very little per month for a $500,000 or a million dollar policy. So you're leveraging a company's uh, significant assets with very little money. That's what insurance really is. So from what I'm understanding, because I think car insurance, home insurance, things like that, I guess life insurance is no different. But to me, it sounds like 
it's really just an investment that somebody else is controlling until you need the payout. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Let's take the, the car house example and then look at a person. So car, you're, you're insuring the value of your car and, uh, and the, uh, the use of your car. So if something happens, you know, the car is replaced or you're also protecting yourself against liability if, if you were to injure someone. A house, again, protecting the value of your house. Your house costs a certain amount of money. You're insuring it for that. So if it burns down or something happens, you know, it's replaced. With life insurance, you're essentially insuring the potential earning power of that individual. You're born, you go to school, you're educated, and then, I don't know, somewhere in your 20s or maybe even, you know, or earlier, you start working. Insurance policy is there to ensure your potential earning ability. You know, and that would span over a certain period of time. So that's what you're doing with a life insurance policy. Your ability to earn money is being protected so that if you pass away prematurely or even or even uh, after a, a long, long period of time, that money, which is leveraged through the policy, through the death benefit, is paid out to a beneficiary. Got it. And the car insurance you may never get if you don't wreck the car. <laughs> or the house insurance if if you never have a fire or something. That can also be the case with sub, with term insurance because you can potentially outlive it. Yeah. Term insurance usually runs from the ages that you, you purchase it at, your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever it may be, till the age of 80. With certain term insurance, what you have to understand is, is that usually now it comes in what's called level period term insurance, which usually runs in blocks of five years. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And then there's even uh, a 40-year policy, which I recently just sold, my first one. That's, it's unusual. What happens in those particular situations is, is that the uh, premium is level for that period of time. After that period expires, the premium then increases significantly because it's a pure risk contract. It has no cash value. Whole life has a level premium. Universal, which I can talk about very briefly, has a flexible premium. But term, once the level period is uh, is expired, it usually increases significantly. That's done because it's, it's a pure risk contract. It's remained level for a period of time. And then it, at that point, you're older and uh, it can it can become very expensive. Usually term is bought by younger people. You can get a lot of coverage for for not a lot of premium. And people usually do that, like in your situation where they're, they just get married, they have kids. I did it myself when I was in the insurance, when I just started in the insurance industry and I we had our daughter. You buy that coverage. It's really inexpensive. Uh, you can get a lot of it. So it's a great, it's a great idea. But, but eventually that level period is going to expire. So then it's going to increase significantly. So what many of these term policies allow is they allow you to convert it to a permanent policy, which is the whole life. So you don't have to get medically underwritten again. You just uh, say, I want to convert it. And they tell you what it is based on your age at that time. And then it's converted over and it becomes it becomes permanent. That's great news because I'm thinking with the baby, you know, Matt, Matt gave me a quick rundown. He said, you know, there's term and there's whole. I recommend term, you know, just 20 year and then they're on their own after that. <laughs> or, or, or it was maybe it was 30. Once you're retired, it's not your problem anymore. Right. That is, uh, there's lots of ways to look at that in an analysis. It sounds like whole, there's a payout no matter what way well, it goes. You, there is cash value, which, which accumulates. So as with the case of my friend, borrow against the policy or you can surrender the policy and take the cash. But no matter what, if you die, it's there for beneficiaries. It's always there. You cannot outlive it. The conversion is a really good tool. Usually you're allowed to convert up to age 65, mm -hmm. and then after that, the conversion option expires. Many people do what's called blending, which means they buy some whole life and they buy some term. And then they either convert it over or they, they, let it, they let it expire when the level period comes off. It's more of a 
how you look at things because, it, you know, you can think of it, oh, I'm young, I'm going to buy term, I don't have to worry about whole, you know, I'm not going to get any whole life, I'll convert it at some other point. That's fine. But you can also buy whole life when you're younger. You have the advantage of the fact that it's much less expensive when you buy it earlier and you have more time for the cash value to build up, the asset to build up. It's not an either or situation. Okay, riddle me this. Because <laughs> before talking with you, I thought, okay, we're going to get a term policy and that'll be great. But then when I hear whole, I realize, okay, it's more expensive, but to me, it sounds like a better deal. Now you told me about this conversion, so I'm like, oh, great. I just get term, and then at some point, uh, when I'm feeling good later on, I'll switch it to whole. Like, that seems like a perfect plan. But then you spring blending on me, and so would it be better to get a term and a tiny little whole and blend it that way, or would it be better to just get the term and then at some point convert it to whole? What would be the least expensive option for the highest payout? <laughs> In, in all of these situations, uh, unfortunately, you are worth a great deal more dead than you are alive. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bruce. It's good yeah. talking to you, too. Yep. Yeah. As uh, I'd like to say, I'm worth a great deal more dead than alive. So, and, and, and people who are well insured, that's, that's, that's the biggest payout. And it comes with one big drawback. So at this point, I'm worth more alive than dead right now, since I'm uninsured. You, well, yeah, I guess so. Oh, great. Okay. But as soon as that baby comes, <laughs> or maybe before. I would do it before. But there's no, again, no right answer and no perfect one-size-fits-all kind of situation. So I would say to answer your questions as to when, how much to get, when to get, which one to get, you need to really sit down and talk with your insurance advisor or your financial advisor and see what you can afford. Because if you can't afford it, you can't maintain it, and it's not going to help you. Once you sit down and you think about this, well, what can you afford? Usually, I would say, if you have limited resources and or having the coverage is more important than having uh, an asset build up. If you are, if you anticipate that it, you know it's going to take a while for your income to it to increase, and at this time, you know you're looking to save as much money as possible by the term and make sure that you have the coverage, because that's the most important. And then as your inc increases, then you can either buy a separate policy or convert some of your term over. It really depends on the individual and your financial resources, because that's where you have to factor in what you can afford, because again, if you, don't, if you can't maintain it and you don't have it, it's not going to do you any good. So what I'm hearing there is blend, don't blend, term, whole, do what you want. Just make sure it's sustainable and you can pay for it. That's the most important thing, yes. And then you can look at these strategies because they all have advantages and they all have uh, disadvantages. You know, you start early. Yes, it's less expensive and you bring it forward. But, you know, usually people are just don't think about it yeah, uh, yeah. when they're younger and they're single. Uh, the whole life is more expensive even when you start it as a younger individual than term. You may not have the money to purchase it at that time. Interrupting the show to mention our Patreon page. Just in case you forgot, we do have one, and that's at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Now, there's a lot of ongoing costs for this show, and I appreciate everybody who's helping me cover those costs. Each episode takes me about 30 hours to complete. Now, this week, I've actually spent more than 60 hours on artistic finance because I'm prepping episodes and guest hosts for April and May. Saying all this to say that a lot of time and a lot of effort are going into this show. If you would like to help cover some of those costs and help these episodes keep happening, please sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash artistic finance. And now back to the show. On the show, I always say, if you're just getting into finance or you're young starting out, open up a Roth IRA. Or I just say the phrase Roth IRA, learn what it is and go for it. So now do I need to start saying, and also consider life insurance? You should. I mean, there, there are some people say, you know what, I'm, I'm only going to deal with term and I'm going to invest the difference. That's definitely one particular way of looking at it because they say I can get far more uh, for my money in the market. Well, yes, that's true. But certain whole life policies give you guarantees. Some of them actually can compete 
with bonds because it is a bond-driven incident. So you're guaranteed a certain amount, accumulates like a bond. So there there is value in having more conservative types of accumulation as opposed to, to the market. If you want market exposure, you can get what's called a variable policy, which is a life insurance that has cash value. The technical term is variable universal. And with a variable policy, you have the option of putting your money into various mutual funds. Technically, there are actually mirror funds of mutual funds, but they they act like mutual funds. And so you can have that exposure in the market and that potential return. You have to be very careful because you can also have a loss in that policy. And the money and the cash value, aside from the premium, funds the policy, the the insurance costs. So with Universal, you usually uh, have to make sure that it's well-funded. That is, that you're putting enough in that if there's potential downside in the uh, the market you still have enough to pay the premium you know to pay the insurance costs in the in the policy okay so just reviewing all that there's term which is you pay for a certain amount of time yes it's like forgive me for interrupting but the, it's like this term insurance is like renting an apartment you pay a certain premium or like a rent while you're doing it you have the use of that coverage whole life is like a mortgage where you're paying money into the mortgage, it's, it's a sinking fund, you're accumulating an asset. You have that cash value that continues to accumulate. You can't outlive it. Term, you can outlive it. Uh, universal, very quickly, is it's like a term policy with an interest-bearing account attached to it. And it's designed to be the least expensive type of permanent policy. So you can't, out, again, you can't outlive permanent policies. This has a unique feature where you are allowed to set your own premium, but you have to be careful because you need to have enough money in that account to make sure insurance charges are are being paid so that the policy can continue. Nowadays, they also have a thing called a guaranteed universal, which means uh, you pay that premium every year. It will always be there regardless of what cash value is in the in the account. Universal, you don't have as much flexibility with that cash value because you need that in there to sort of run the policy. With whole life, you have more flexibility. So universal is a least expensive permanent. Then you have variable universal, which allows you exposure to mutual funds to to the market, which could potentially get you a higher return on that cash value, but you also have greater risk. Those are very briefly, the various types of policies. And you really look at term being like renting and whole life as sort of like a mortgage, paying a mortgage. Whole life, do you just pay that until you die? Or is there a point where you stop paying into it? There are contracts where you pay it every year until you die. With a policy, you can use your dividends to pay the premium you have to remember that that will reduce your cash value because those dividends are put into the cash value and they build up. If you're diverting them to pay your premium, which you can after a period of time when they when they become large enough, you will have less cash value. There are also limited pay contracts that are designed where the premium stops after a certain period of time, 10 years, 15 years, or when the insured reaches the age of 65. Okay. So you couldn't put more money into those contracts uh, if you wanted to. You couldn't pay more premium if you wanted to. But after the premium stops, you still get your dividend interest rate. And with my, my friend, where I mentioned that example, I actually sold him a limited pay contract at age 65. So in the next couple of years, he will stop paying the premium. So it's actually... You know, it it worked out very well for him. So uh, there are limited pay contracts. Uh, You can use the dividend interest rate or you can continue to pay it. So whole life is flexible in that way. Got it. What is the most common? There isn't any particular kind. Usually some people want that cash value to build up so they don't want to use the dividends. A lot of people, you know, when they see the dividends are there, they go, why don't I just have them pay? They go, yeah, why not? And some people 
The limited pay contracts is usually when you're structuring it. Again, this is where your agent comes in, where you're saying, you know, you're young enough where let's do a, a limited pay to 65. So when you get to that, maybe not retirement age, but at one point it was retirement age, the idea would be you don't have that expense anymore. You have your insurance and you have your cash value. You can do what you want with it, but you don't have to worry about paying the premium. When you have business uh, cases where businesses are involved, they might want to use whole life uh, with limited pay for certain reasons. Uh, I would say the limited pays are maybe a bit less common. It really, uh, you know, it depends. So if I were to go out and get a whole life today, would I probably be put on one where I would stop at 65? It wouldn't be a, a bad thing. I mean, uh, I mean... I mean, how old are you at this point? You're 34. You're 34. So I don't know uh, personally, uh, if you came to me, I don't know if there would be any reason to have a, a limited pay whole life for 10 or 15 years. And in fact, in that situation, you know, the premium is higher than if you got a whole life contract that went to age 100 because you have to, to put a more in, it's sort of like front loaded in a sense, because you have to put more in earlier because you're not going to be putting premiums in after that 10 or 15 year period. I would probably recommend an age 65 contract for you because then you would have, you know, you'd have enough time to put money into that, build it up. And then at age 65, it just stops. Um, But you could also in any instance, you could use dividend interest as as it builds up, of course, remembering that it would reduce the cash value. All right. Okay. So now for the million dollar question, how much coverage do I need? So if you wanted to do a quick and dirty back of the envelope kind of thing where you said, I need, I need to know this in, uh, in, in 60 seconds, you could say 10 times salary. That's a very quick, dirty kind of way of, 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 doing, a, uh, of doing an analysis. So you got to look at all your financial obligations. Those would be, well, are you buying this uh, to replace income? If so, then you look at what your annual or monthly expenses are. You know, you can, you can go through a list. Do you have a mortgage? No. Okay. But if you had a mortgage and you wanted it paid off if, if you passed away, that would be factored into. If you have kids, do you want to pay for their college education? And private colleges are very expensive nowadays. Do you want to leave a a legacy, you know, not just to a charity, but you want to make sure that, you know what, I want my kids to have some money when I pass away that they can then use for whatever it may be, getting married or or if they have other kids, you know, when they have kids, they can use it or they can use it to buy a house. Then there's final expenses, you know, to make sure that you are, funeral expenses are taken care of and you may just want to leave money for a charity. So all of those, those are just a small example of what you would want to consider. Uh, and then there's sort of the inflationary aspect to it. So um, a lot of times you will find using needs-based software where you take all of these questions and you, I'm sure Matt has given you a lot of questions to answer as to terms your assets, your expenses, uh, your obligations, they put it all into a into a software, and then they inflate it out over a period of time, and then and then you get a certain number. The problem with that is that usually inflation would run two to three percent. Now we are in a in a very unusual time where inflation is much higher, so you'd have to factor that in. And then also with college education. Uh, that usually ran twice the rate of uh, of inflation, you know, somewhere between four to six percent. If you put all of those into into a software and then inflate it out, you would get some very lar- large numbers, uh, which are kind of uh, uh, a bit scary. You could come out with a, a need in the millions of dollars, and it can be very expensive to fund that kind of thing, uh, and that might be one reason why people go with straight term when they look at it. So, you know, it's all hypothetical. Inflation as it is right now is sort of a much trickier kind of thing when you're looking at that now. And I, with, a, with, with, with some clients, I, I have done those types of calculations in my earlier career. And one of the issues that I came up against was that when you inflated out, you came out with very large numbers where 
clients were like balking and like yeah. telling me I need three million, five million. To, so that's something you got to take into account too. Yeah, Matt gave me a life insurance calculator at lifehappens.org. It's probably very useful. And just keep in mind that when you do inflation with these types of, of software calculators, you're going to come up with some large numbers, especially with the inflationary uh, uh, conditions we have now. All right. So I've decided I'm going to get life insurance. I've decided I figured out some amount that I want. I want a million dollar policy. So where's the best place to go purchase it? Good question. And there's no right answer. <laughs> okay, well, all right. Triple A sends us mailers and yes. they say, get life insurance with well, us. That's one way. The best way to acquire life insurance is to find a professional agent or broker that you trust. Typically, you would do a term study. What does that mean? Well, you give, you give me your age. You give me your health status. You know, are you healthy? Yeah. Do you smoke or do you not smoke? And uh, then you run a study, which means you go out and there's, again, software that we use where we can look at various companies. I would say only A-rated companies, but you go out and you look at various companies that provide various term products that are available. In this situation, it would be the state of New York. So all insurance, which you should should know, all insurance is very state-specific because it is controlled by the state insurance department. One product that may be uh, approved for sale in one state is not approved for sale in another state. Like, for example, in New York, where we have a very stringent, probably the most technically proficient and most strict insurance department is in New York State. So a lot of products that are available in other states are not available here because they don't pass muster. And in fact, New York can be so difficult to do business in that certain insurance companies have to create subsidiaries to meet their requirements. Question for you, which is, Nicole and I are going to leave New York City. No, we're going to leave New York in June. Should I hold off and wait to get life insurance until we leave New York? No, no. It, it's not going to be. I mean, most term products that are available uh, in other states are available in New York. I mean, they're there. It's not that it, it tends to deal with certain other kinds of insurance products, but most life insurance products are available. It's just, for example, like if you're looking for a 40-year term, there may not be as many companies available in New York as, as there are in other states. It depends on, on certain uh, variations of certain products, but I wouldn't hold up. So then you would, once you do a term study and you see the most competitive premiums, and you can treat it as simply a commodity and say, I'm going to get the lowest premium because you know, this is term, I'm going to keep it for a certain period of time, I'm going to get rid of it, so I just want to pay the least amount of money. I want to, in the next 20 years, I want to pay the lowest premium. So that's one consideration. But the other thing is, is that if you want to convert it, you want to make sure that that company sells products that you can convert it to. And you want to make sure that those products are, in fact, quality products. There are a lot of companies out there that uh, sort of specialize in the term market that don't have a lot of permanent products that you can convert to or, or even products that you would want to convert to, you know, usually universal type products they have. But there are less and less companies out there that are selling a really good whole life policies. So that's another consideration. So you might want to spend more money. Usually the companies that have good permanent products like whole life are somewhat more expensive in their term than a company that specializes in term. You might, based on that consideration, pay more money for a company that has a good product that you can convert to because you want to you want to be able to do that. Now, there's no guarantee that certain products will be available, but in terms of their history, if they have put out and they're definitely in that type of market, they'll more than likely be in that market. How would I know what is a good company, like just off the top of my head, like Progressive, I see their ads around. I would rely on your agent to guide you in that particular area. Like I could I could name a bunch of companies here uh, that I usually deal with, which, you know, uh, 
that are AAA rated. There are companies that I go to for whole life policies. Some companies I go to for universal, depending, and again, this depends on the uh, study, you know, when I look at your age and uh, smoker, non-smoker, the amount of coverage you want and, and your health, it depends on which company would be, you know, the best for that. Because certain companies, th- this is again where your agent comes in. You mentioned, where can I go? You could go online. You can, you know, buy it over the phone. You can, you can do those types of things. The way they usually advertise is, oh, you know, you know, a uh, 35-year-old male can get 500000 for just $25 a month. You know, it's great. Well, not necessarily, because there is a thing called underwriting. When you go for an application, in many instances, they require a paramedical exam, which is not a full exam, but it still requires blood and urine samples and medical questions, or it could be an abbreviated just medical question. So you go through a medical underwriting, and if you fall into a certain category, you can get those types of policies. If you fall out of that profile, they can come back to you and say, well, we need more information, or they may actually uh, go to your doctor and request your medical records. A good agent is someone who understands the underwriting process and will look at certain companies that treat certain, you know, especially if you have a condition, some companies treat treat it more favorably than other companies. That's another consideration. So I wouldn't recommend going online and doing all this stuff. I mean, you could get it, but it could be very frustrating because the, they are requiring other types of information for the underwriting process to take place. Uh, if you were going to emphasize just one thing, find a good agent, a broker. Uh, you know, if you like that person, you know, you have to like that person, be able to work with them. But if you... But only for like a day or a, a month, however long it takes, and then, then you don't have to deal with them. Yes and no. Uh, there are clients like that, and there are other clients that'll stay with you, who stay with an uh, for, for the rest of their lives. I would say most of my clients are, are people I know pretty well, and uh, some I know very well, and uh, I like all of them. Uh, recently, I've been getting calls from some older clients who have their insurance set and they say, you know what, I want to talk to you about this or something is changing. Some agents will do annual reviews a lot. It will come to that client every year and say what's changed or whatever. Some some won't. I don't necessarily do it every year, but I do over a period of time, check in with my clients, see how they're, you know, see what they're doing, what has changed, what needs to be changed. Because it's sort of evolutionary because if you, as you get older or as your kids get older, you may want to drop coverage. You may want to uh, change that coverage, get more uh, coverage for certain things. Got it. Okay, because I was thinking, oh, we buy, buy a term policy, and then we're done. You could be, but I would view it more as a moving target. Um, all right. Just to clarify a point, you said uh, insurance broker, insurance agent. What's the difference there? Does it matter? There's a couple of little distinctions. Uh, technically, an agent represents the insurance company. Uh, if I work for a particular company and I was an agent, I represent them. So I represent them and I go out and solicit business. A broker technically represents the individual who is looking for coverage. Now, in reality, an agent is a broker and a broker can be an agent because they both, you have fiduciary responsibilities to both sides. As an agent, you have fiduciary responsibility to the company where you're saying all the information that I've recorded from taken from this individual is accurate to the best of my knowledge. They will ask you to attest to that. On the other side, you are uh, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the individual looking for insurance by making sure that you work for them to get the best premium for what they're looking for, in your opinion, and to get them through the underwriting process. So you, you know, and you have to maintain their information according to the HIPAA laws for the medical information and other stuff, just in general confidentiality. Now, there is a type of an agent called a captive agent that works for one insurance company and no other insurance companies. So there are very few companies that have captive agent systems. Some companies have career agent systems, but they're not captive. They can work for other insurance companies, even though they're a career agent. 
Okay, wait. When we say insurance company, because I'm thinking agent is like somebody that works at Geico, and you call Geico and say, hey, I want insurance. That's the agent. Well, so when I started my career, I worked for a company called Mass Mutual, one of the few AAA rated companies, great company. I was a career agent at that point. I was an employee of Mass Mutual in that point. I went out and I solicited business as a career agent. I was also a broker when I represented my clients. Uh, but I was not captive. In other words, I could do business with other insurance agents, other insurance companies. A captive insurance agent, let's say like with Northwestern Mutual, are usually uh, restricted to selling Northwestern products. Now, when I left Mass Mutual, I opened up my own company, Camaro and Associates. So I then I get, became, in that instance, really a broker because I then had relationships with many insurance companies, but I went out and represented, I was not an employee of them. So it became a broker because I would bring clients, I would look at which company would be best for them, but I would be bringing the client to them without being an employee of that company. So I was a, considered a broker. And what you have to understand is, is that when you're a broker, you're an agent, and when you're an agent, you're a broker in the technical legal sense. But those are the differences. You can find agents that work for a particular company, in which case, you know, they're probably a lot more prone to showing you their products. Yeah. Whether or not they can work with another company or not, their universe is generally their product. When you work with someone who is not an employee of, a, of an insurance company, they're going to probably be looking at a larger spectrum of products for you. So if I, if I were to go get insurance right now, you said, don't just log on to Geico.com and buy a policy. Talk to somebody. But I don't want to just call Geico as sort of what I'm feeling here. So how do I know who to call? Like, how do I find a broker? I guess what I would do is I would talk to people you know and see if they've had good experiences with a particular broker uh, or agent. Now, just because someone is an agent who's an employee of an insurance company doesn't mean that they're not going to handle your needs in the right way. But I'm just saying that a broker who is not a career agent or whatever probably has a broader outlook on how to approach your stuff just in general. There are great agents in, 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 in and they're great brokers. So talk to your friend. You know, they have insurance. How did you get insurance? Do you like that person? Great. Can you refer me to him? Because uh, a lot of my business comes from, from word of mouth referrals. That is probably the best way because you have people who've had experiences with, these, with an agent or broker. There are lots of lists. You can look them up. Are you on any lists? Are we, have you been... Have you, bl uh, have you been blackballed? Is there something we don't know? No. <laughs> You're on gold star lists. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, <laughs> there are Department of Financial Services, which is what New York's insurance department is called because uh, they merged banking and insurance together. They maintain lists of licensed brokers and agents. Uh, you can go and look at there, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're Good. Yeah. They're, they're that's just right. they're just legal. They're just licensed, <laughs> and that's and that. I, mean, I, that's I see it. this going back to what you said. Find somebody you like. That's sort of what I'm hearing. Yeah, and I think the best way to do that is to to ask someone you trust uh, who has had some experience in purchasing uh, insurance. Um, yeah, I mean, as we think about it, I'm thinking like my family and friends. I have no idea if any of them have insurance. I assume they all do. I assume everyone else is a mature adult that has done, done this. There's lots of people who don't. So soon I will not be one of those people. <laughs> um, one little thing that you've mentioned, just ratings, you could say AAA versus A rating. Is AAA better than A? Is A better than AAA? As long as you deal with an A rated company, you're fine. But is AAA better? I always want AAA. the best. In terms of the way they're rated, yes. In terms of the way their <laughs> assets are are managed from the rating company, yes. But, you know, there are lots of good companies that supply term that are A-rated or A, A-plus or not. There are very few companies that are in the AAA-rated area. So I wouldn't... I see. I just need A. I gotcha. Yeah. I would say as long as they're an A-rated... When I was in school, there was only A-plus was the highest. So I, I didn't know if double A, triple A, I don't know if it was better or worse. And there's there's very few companies in the triple A-rated area, which they happen to be mainly mutual companies that sell, that are very good in the permanent, permanent market 
area and uh, their term is usually more expensive, you know, like a mass mutual. All right. So what I've learned today is I need life insurance and I should find a broker and they'll help me. That's sort of what I'm taking away from here. I've learned more than I ever thought I would want to know about life insurance. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not going to, but I could spend another five hours talking to you about this. Uh, (laughs) Amazing. We'll have you on for part two. It it is interesting that a lot of clients, after they meet with me, say, you know, I never never knew insurance could be so interesting. So a lot of people think that it's kind of boring, and I guess, you know... It is. I assure you, it is. There are, you know, like, uh, I've taken a lot of uh, continuing education classes that I wish I hadn't. But it is interesting, especially in terms of how it can intersect with your life and, and, and how it can be structured. And there's a lot of, you know, when you get into situations where businesses, where you have more sophisticated structuring, it can be very interesting. You say very interesting. I say sounds like a racket. I'm going to be honest, Bruce. <laughs> but it sounds like a very useful thing for the individual. So I do, I do recognize that it is important and a good thing. It's only a racket. If you don't need the coverage, you know, there are people who are sold things they don't need, you know, in that case, yeah. But if you need the coverage, yeah. it's not a racket. Well, where it gets interesting to me is like the trying to eke more out of it or, you know, getting the most for the that's, least. That's how it's structured. And then I always think, well, how does the insurance company make money? Because they want to be doing this if they weren't making money. You know, it's a higher, highly regulated business. So before a product can be sold... It has to be designed by the actuaries and the business people look at it as well and then presented to that particular state insurance department. Then it has to be approved. So, you know, just to sort of push back a little bit on that, there are certain products that can be sold in some states that are not allowed in New York because the premium isn't high enough. And that's not because the insurance company wants to make more money. And that's because... The Department of Financial Services saying, I don't think they're taking in enough money for a reserve to be created for this particular product. So anything that's passed, uh, that's approved, uh, has the consumer in mind. Again, in New York State, I'll, I'll also point out there's now what's called the Regulation 187, which is now a suitability section where everyone has to go through this, where they, you talk about your assets, your expenses, your goals, and you, the, the consumer who is uh, purchasing this has to go through this with you and has to sign off on this, saying, yeah, I understand this, I understand that, I understand that. So there are many protections for, for the consumer. You know, some people even think that that this particular thing is like ridiculous. You know, they go through this and they say, I'm buying an insurance policy. Why do I have to do this? You know, uh, you know, it's like, okay, you know, get to the point. And they go, well, they feel that you need to need to go through this to make sure that you understand what you're purchasing. So actually, I'm glad you said all that because it actually does make me feel better. Because I just I have trust issues. Real, real trust issues. You know, and if you're a big box store, I have trust issues. <laughs> if you're an airline, I have trust issues. After you go through 187, you're going you're gonna to be uh, disgusted because it's going to be so thorough. You're going to go, I know what I want. Why, why are they making me do this? Don't blame the agent of the broker. They're required. This is in New York. This is specifically in New York State, which is why. Are you sure I shouldn't wait to move out before I no. do this? Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> I have to do it somewhere else, I guess. It just won't be called 187. It'll have a different name. Well, actually, 187 is, I mean, it's because New York is famous for being consumer-friendly in terms of protection with insurance. If you, if so Maybe I should do it here. It's better yeah, to do well, it here. Well, actually, I would say yes. And as a New, York, as a New Yorker, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we have a department like that that, that takes such such care or, you know, in what they do, although they can be annoying at times because sometimes uh, there is a bit of overkill in some of this stuff. I think it just becomes too much. But, you know, anything that protects the consumer, I think, is is a good thing. You should feel, you know, good about the fact that there are a lot of requirements in place before a, a policy is sold. And a good, a good agent would, would want that anyway. I understand. That's like the MTA. If I think of the MTA, I don't like them. But... 
the fact is, most of the time I can get from point A to point B because the MTA exists. <laughs> yeah, they, well, you know, they, like, they run a complicated system. Exactly. Uh, uh, they yeah. do a pretty good job. They do a pretty good job, I must admit. <laughs> um, all right, Bruce, I've learned so much. Is there anything about life insurance that we haven't touched on before we wrap this up? As I said, I could I could sit here for five hours and talk to you about various kinds of, of plans but I won't. Uh, And uh, I would say on a basic level, I think we covered everything. Uh, You should really keep in mind, uh, the best way to get insurance, in my view, is find someone who's had a good relationship with that agent that they can recommend or broker that they can recommend. Be aware of, of what your goals are in purchasing a policy. Why do I want this coverage? And who is it for? What are the reasons? Be aware of of what your goals are and be able to articulate them, and then basically understand that there's no there's no right or wrong answer or solution to what you're looking for. Various types of coverage can be what you need. Most importantly, when you're looking at acquiring coverage, is can you afford it and can you maintain it? Because if you don't have it, it's not going to do you any good. What is one piece of financial advice? that you can give somebody who's looking to get life insurance? Or is it rather just you're going to pay more for a higher quality product and you're going to pay less? Not necessarily. I think it's uh, make sure you can afford it uh, would probably be the, the, uh, the first thing I would say. And then make sure that it is actually accomplishing your goals. If you're looking to just cover for income replacement for a spouse and children, okay. If you're wanted to generate cash value, make sure you know what your goals are and make sure you can afford it. That's uh, why you want to qualify a really good agent or broker, because that person will guide you through the process and make sure what you're purchasing does in fact meet your needs. And that's really what I think what the 187 suitability regulations are really looking for. Do you, do you need it? Doesn't meet your needs? Can you afford it? And that's really where where I would focus on. All right. Can you afford it? Can you sustain it? Does it meet your needs? It doesn't meet your needs. All right. Uh, Bruce, where can people... So they can find me on LinkedIn. And I am uh, presently uh, increasing my social media presence. So I, I will have a corporate corporate page on Facebook and, and actually on Instagram. But they can reach me at BAK at nyc.rr.com by telephone, I guess, uh, at 646-438-9621, or they can, they can reach me on LinkedIn. Okay, final question, and this is just for fun. Uh, this is just something I like to throw in. Is there any question that you would like to ask me? Did you find this interesting, I guess, this would be my question. I, I, I did. Actually, jokingly, you say you could talk about it for five more hours. I honestly could talk about it for five more hours, too. There's a lot to it and a lot of complications, even though I think it, I'm probably going to boil down to getting just term. But now that I know I can convert it, that's sort of interesting. So I just have to, my check boxes are, okay, I need term and I need a company that maybe I can convert it later on. Yeah, I could, I could, I could have gone in, in depth more on this as well. I mean, we, we talked for... An hour and a half. <laughs> I have to say, this is this is the first time I've been on a podcast, and uh, I found it very enjoyable. So I, I want to thank you for... Uh, Absolutely. All right. Well, Bruce, really appreciate it, and I, I did learn a lot. So thank you. My pleasure. Hope to be back for, for other types of uh, discussions on yeah, insurance. Yeah. We have, I, I'm sure there's a lot more we can cover, because I'm sure people listening have a lot of questions, too. And for being your first podcast, I think you totally aced it. You're a very, very good guest. That's it for this week's episode. My takeaways are that term is the least expensive and the best option to ensure coverage with a lower income. Whole builds cash value, but it's more expensive. Universal is the least expensive way to access a whole life policy. And variable universal is for people who want to use life insurance as a vehicle to take advantage of stock market growth to get a higher value out of the asset. But it comes with the risk that the market could take a downturn when the time arrives to redeem the policy. A note on universal coverage. In a part of the interview that I cut out, Bruce mentioned that universal is usually for older people who have a need for whole life, but don't want to pay as much. 
aka most people use term or whole. If you're looking at term with the idea that you may switch to whole at some point, be sure to check that the company you buy it from is reputable and it has that option. So if you're looking at term for the most affordable option, do consider paying slightly more for a company that is better rated if they have more options for you later on. Insurance is state specific, and I'm bringing that up because states like California and New York have stronger consumer protection laws, which means that if you see insurance that says not available in New York, you then have to wonder what consumer protection does New York have that you're not going to get by purchasing that policy. Bruce said that in relationship to life insurance, this isn't much of a difference. It's more about universal and mutual fund policies, but all else being equal, a company that can do business in New York might be a safer option than one that can't operate in New York. This now explains the times in the past when I've bought travel insurance. I found a great package that was not very expensive. And then when I went to purchase, it wasn't available because I lived in New York. Now, in the past, this has always annoyed me, but but now I realize that was actually something forcing me to purchase a higher quality product. Again, not saying that you need a policy that can be bought or sold in New York or California, but now you know one of the reasons may be because there is part of the policy or part of the company that doesn't fulfill your state's consumer protection rules. This takeaway is just a hot take from me. Life insurance could be like a mortgage for people who don't have mortgages. So when you look into wealth building, Real estate always comes up as part of a portfolio for wealth. However, for entertainment workers who often live in high cost of living areas, purchasing a home or property isn't really feasible because of the cost. Now, there are other ways of getting into real estate, such as REITs, which we purchased for our 6K investing special. There's also long distance rental properties, which is buying a property outside of a big city that's more affordable. There can be tax savings to owning property, and if you run into problems, you can liquidate the home, or with REITs, you can sell out. However, if real estate is of no interest to you, I now view life insurance as an alternative investment. It's forced savings, and it's basically like owning a portfolio of bonds, and it guarantees a payout for you or your beneficiaries. Now, unlike owning a home, you have to pay your life insurance policy and your rent, and a big thing, you can never stop paying or the coverage will lapse. Unless, of course, you have a policy that stops at 65, which it sounds like is very reasonable to get. Aside from making sure you pay every month, it is a way to build an asset that regardless of what the stock market does and regardless of the real estate market, and regardless of if you move from location to location, you'll be building this financial asset that can come in handy if needed. And even if you never need it, you leave it to your beneficiaries, just like a property would be left behind. There are lots of alternative assets that you could do this with. We've covered wine and masterworks on the 6K investing specials. Obviously, a property, a retirement account, or a big Broadway royalty show could also be left behind for beneficiaries. But if you want a safe and reliable vehicle, you can consider a whole life insurance policy, which is less flexible, but is super low maintenance. Now, regarding the lapse in coverage, if you stop paying the policy, yes, if you stop paying, that coverage is going to lapse. But because whole life policies are building cash value, that value will be automatically deducted from to pay for the policy until it runs out and then the policy will lapse. But that means that there's a bit of a fail safe if you run into hard times. If you've been paying for several years, you can use that value to pay the policy. Now, remember, it depletes the value, but it still keeps the policy in existence. And the final takeaway is what Bruce repeatedly said, and that is if you're looking for life insurance, ask the people around you for recommendations, find a broker or a non-captive agent for the most options, and make sure that you can afford it and you can pay for it every year. I did what Bruce said, and I reached out to my parents and my in-laws, and I asked them what they did for insurance. Just as I sort of expected, they had term insurance. Now, both of them got it through their work, or at least partially through their work. But once their children were grown and gone out of the house, they let that term insurance expire. I haven't quite made a decision on what we're going to do with our upcoming baby, but I suspect it's going to be the same, which is getting term insurance until they're 20 or 25. 
All right, this episode went a bit long. I hope you learned something about life insurance and you're able to use this to decide whether it's something for you. If you find value in listening to this show, consider helping me continue by supporting me in a way that's convenient for you. Following or subscribing to the show on any podcast app is super helpful. Subscribing to our YouTube channel helps us out. And telling somebody about the show or commenting on social media also is super helpful. And of course, my favorite way of supporting the show is by you helping me produce it by becoming a patron. Patrons pledge three, five, or ten dollars a month, and they get a private podcast feed. Sign up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Two final reminders before we go. Now, first, our book club meeting is this Saturday. Find details at artisticfinance.com slash book club. And our final reminder which is remember to contribute to your Roth IRA. Obviously, any retirement account will do, but my favorite is a Roth IRA. It's super easy to set up, so go create it and automate monthly payments into it so that you can't forget to save for yourself. Imagine yourself when you're old and frail if you're so lucky to reach that age. Now that old and frail you won't be able to thank me because I'll probably be dead, but Perhaps the old and frail you will transcend time and you will thank me. Just trust me on this. All right, that's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. The show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.